So welcome everybody to another episode of Chocolate Travels. I'm here with Olivier from Gaston Chocolat in Vanuatu. So hello, Olivier. Nice to meet you. Hi, guys. Hi, Joseph. <laughs> How are you? Let's start from the beginning. Um, I want to know what series of events in your life brought you to Vanuatu uh, to make chocolate from Binto Bar. How did you get there? Uh, in every good story, there is always love and romance. So basically, it was my wife. She was born and raised in Vanuatu. Uh, I used to work as a commodities trader. That was my uh, school uh, graduation and training. I did that for six years. I was based in London. And uh, I was a friend of my wife's sister who got uh, married in Vanuatu. That was my first time in 2006. And uh, we both fell in love. She went to South Africa to study. We traveled a bit of the world. And 2009, Christmas, we came back here. And I was like, how about we settle in Vanuatu? There is cacao, there is coffee. Uh, my original intention was to only uh, export cacao for chocolate makers. I was not a chocolate maker by trade at uh, any mm -hmm. point in time. And uh, I had to learn it on the spot. Um, traveled back to Australia. Met lots of Bintu Bar makers back in the days, and that's how Gaston started. So you had some background knowledge already about cacao, but nothing about chocolate making? Yeah, okay. definitely. Uh, I knew I knew the difference between cacaos, and uh, I was very interested in um, developing something in Vanuatu, because it's still a developing country, so there isn't much industry. Um, came with quite a few challenges, uh, introducing new techniques on how to ferment and prepare the cacao so it's good for uh, chocolate making because the, the, the knowledge here was more on the bulk market type of cacao. So not much attention paid to uh, fermentation, uh, processing, pre and post harvest uh, methods. So it took about five years for us to get to uh, nice consistent uh, results, uh, both in quality and volume. So you gained some of your chocolate making knowledge from Australia. How did you learn how to ferment properly? Where did you gain that knowledge? Fermentation, curing, drying, or was that just trial and error? So there, there were three, three key uh, steps in, in developing the cacao. One was uh, meeting with, there is a local uh, research center. It's based on Santo Island in the northern part of Vanuatu. And uh, it's inherited uh, from the French English condominium before Vanuatu was independent, that facility was created. So lots of people come over to Vanuatu to do their research, uh, mostly people doing PhDs. And uh, there was a lot of stuff that was already available in terms of intellectual knowledge. Uh, then I contacted the French uh, CIRAD in uh, Montpellier and uh, read um, as many of the books that they had available. And I took my chance and just called directly, emailed some of those people who wrote those brilliant pieces of research. And it's incredible the amount of help and support we received just for free. Like people somehow, it moved something in them. I, I was just telling them, look, we, we are nobody. We are at the far end of the world and we'd like to make a nicer kick out. Would you help us? And many people literally stepped into the thing, answered favorably um, from Stefan Bona at Bona Chocolates to um, mm -hmm. Michel Barrett. Lots of people who really mm -hmm. worked uh, hard for that research. Wonderful. So that's how we got our hand cacao. And then the long iteration, like we, we tried things, we measured, we failed, we tried again until we basically got it right. So you had some knowledge, some help, but it still came down to a bit of trial and error on your part to figure out how to properly ferment it to achieve the results that you're looking for, right? Always. Uh, there is a lot of learning that is also impacted by the actual environments. Uh, to give you an example, like we have two harvest seasons in Vanuatu, a short one and a long one. And we vary our fermentation profile from the short to the long season because the long season is right in the winter. And at night, we go as low as 15, 16 degrees Celsius sometimes, 
which slows the fermentation. So we tend to add a few, um, like half a day to one more day to our fermentation profile. So the, the, the actual flavor is consistent throughout the year. Okay. Otherwise you'd have like big differences in flavors from one, uh, one season to the next and one harvest to the next. Right. That's a good point. When you were working with farmers to perhaps change the way they were fermenting, how did that go? Uh, building those relationships, um, you know, the mutual understandings between the two parties. Did that go very smoothly? Was there a lot of work involved there? It's, uh, I'll be very frank and direct. It's all about money. Uh, the minute you step in with something new, if you show them there is this niche market, which at Vanna Two Size is already a huge market overseas, and that uh, we could tap into that uh, new market with much higher return for them. They were all pretty game, uh, though they were always very suspicious on why we were doing things in different ways. So my approach would usually be, I still train farmers, like we were still expanding the network. Uh, I'd go in the village and do a harvest their way first. So I say, look, let's go in the field and do a harvest together. And then the following day, we do it my way. And then we compare the, 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 the volume harvested, the quality of the work, the time by which we finish. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the, the financing. It's all like managing the, the harvest, planning the tools, getting the people ready, uh, the way they move in the fields. Um, that, that, those are simple things that we basically had to learn on the spots and we've developed some techniques uh, to make the work more easier for them as well. So okay. we work in groups of ten three people cutting fruits. We have four people killing the pods. We remove the machete from the bug killing site. So there is no uh, harm to the, the beans themselves. Mm -hmm. And there is a pre-sorting directly in the fields. We separate all the small stuff that goes back into the bulk market. So there is two sources of revenue for them. They can mm -hmm. still sell the lower size because you, you want something that is pretty uh, consistent in size. So the, the, the roasting down the line is more easy. Right. If you work with that are very tiny and large beans in the same batch, like you over roast and under roast part of them, and that's not very good for flavor development profiles. Mm -hmm. So that's all the, in the field upstream. I'm a strong believer in the, the more work we can do in the field, the better, because I can pay the farmer more for that. Right. When it comes down to the factory or the storage facility for export, if we have to rework it here, it's less money that goes to the rural areas, and there is a real uh, connection to development. Uh, I did a lot of job for developing agencies, so we're fully aware of the uh, social impacts, the environmental impact, and we try and teach that on the side. Mm. It's disseminated through the training we provide to the farmers. So it's not just fermentation. And it's also about building the right infrastructure, because most of the time they, they used to work on this um, flat case, like the box are all lined up at a flat level. We introduced the cascade type of fermentation. Mm -hmm. So we built new types of boxes that allows for women to step into the work. Um, people with disability can also be a uh, centralized fermentation station manager. I have right. two of them and they, they work perfectly, but that's taking some time to understand where is the heavy lifting, uh, what needs to be implemented for them to have a way of working that is not uh, painful. Mm. goes smoothly and sorry remind me again when did you when you were doing your research and developing the fermentation what year was that how long have you been doing this now in vanuatu the the, the year we spent most time developing uh was 2015 uh, okay. i actually spent over four months in malekula so i was right in the island in the villages and working uh on a daily basis with them that helps as well for acceptation uh, I, I speak fluent uh, Bishlama, and in terms of integration, they don't see you the same way as if you're coming in and trying to just like approach them with a, uh, everyone speaks English in Vanuatu. It's an okay. ex French and English opinion, mm -hmm. but when you do speak, it's a big difference. Like it breaks barriers. Vanuatu is made up of many, many islands, correct? Yep. 83. So would you say that the cacao is tends to be genetically very similar, or is there a lot of variation in different parts of Vanuatu, different islands? Yeah, um, it grows mostly in the north. We are at the far south limits of what is called the cacao belt, that intertropical region where cacao is growing on a commercial size, I'm meaning. 
Uh, you find cacao down in New Caledonia, which is a thousand kilometers further south, but to grow it commercially, it's a bigger challenge. Knowing that our launch season comes in the winter, you have a lot of uh, seasonal impact from the, the, the low temperature of the winter time, especially at night. So we tend to work mostly in the northern islands of Vanuatu and Gaston's 100% uh, focused on Malekul Island. It's the second largest in the archipelago. Uh, we have a weekly schedule with the ferry. Like there is a big part that is just related to logistic on why we work there. We went mm -hmm. to where it's actually easy to work because uh, the costs are so high to run an operation in Vanuatu that you wouldn't risk yourself to go in the remotest part of Vanuatu. Now, when it comes to genetic, there, there are some variations because uh, there have been different uh, programs of uh, planting cacao. It's not an endemic species from Vanuatu. It was introduced by men. And uh, we did a bit of story research with the um, uh, local uh, library and uh, historical center in Vanuatu. The further we could go back for commercial trade was 1850s with the Dutch basically traveling from Trinidad and Tobago, going around the Africa, selling in Madagascar, moving down to Indonesia, Timor, mm. PNG, Solomons, and Vanuatu. And that stream of cacao is the Amelonado Trinitario type. That's, a, that's the main genetic we find. It's mm. nice for dark It's very complex flavors, a lot of red berry, uh, apricot flavors. It's pretty nice to work with. And the other stream came with the Spanish who settled in the Philippines and then they disseminated the forastero across the whole region. Mm -hmm. So when you look at uh, genetics in um, Vanuatu, uh, Solomon Islands, PNG, Fiji, they're pretty much the same. I worked in all those countries. I've had farmers throughout the years. I get lots of calls and uh, it's usually NGOs trying to develop projects. So they call me, I go for two weeks to train farmers and then they do the train the trainee program down the line. So I've seen quite a, a few plantation and it's pretty much yeah. the same genetics all around the Pacific. Has there been any new introductions in the past five, 10 years or so? There, there has been, uh, there's still research going on with the Vanuatu Research Center in, uh, in Santo. They have the largest uh, uh, genetics uh, available in stock, like in the whole Pacific. They've been importing oh, okay. plants and seeds from everywhere, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I'm totally objective, uh, reintroduction of species, uh, it's kind of a Star Wars level of uh, advance in technology for the farmers I'm working with. Like we're trying to teach them how to properly manage a plantation we are more uh, interested in working with what's already available in the field and improve uh, through the years the genetics. We, you, you can do a lot by just uh, selecting the best trees, the best fruits, uh, doing your grafting and nursery from those trees. Like you don't necessarily have to reintroduce stuff. Uh, a very good example to not to play too much with new genetics as well was a program run in the 80s where they introduced uh, E83 uh, hybrids. It's very sweet, and uh, the issue is it brought in a lot of rats. The population of rats overdeveloped. It was very hard to control, so I would be very cautious in bringing in staff without measuring the potential impact on the farmers. Mm. It might have a lower uh, yield as well. It might give less fruits. Like another example, like late uh, 2010, uh, there was a big go for uh, sun drying for the fine flavor markets. Uh, the local farmers were used to do some more type of dryer, the hot air dryer. So there's a hot pipe with firewood burning in there. And that is basically uh, drying. They say cooking in Vanuatu, which is interesting because I believe it's a roasting, it's not a drying. Mm. But uh, that was the way of the bell chocolate. And it's very quick to dry. It takes three to five days to dry, right? When you introduce the sun drying, it's 10 days to two weeks time. So if you do not build twice as many of those dryers, you're basically uh, lowering the capacity of the farmers and tapping right into their incomes. So I saw a lot of uh, NGOs stepping into the game and coming in with 30% premiums and being very proud of what they were doing with the good intentions. But the actual impact on the income stream for the farmers was lowering by 60 to 70% because mm -hmm. we swapped the, the technique to drying. 
So you really have to be careful when you do that sort of things, uh, whether it's genetics or new techniques and uh, spend time in the field to measure accurately the impact. Otherwise, it could be very detrimental and that's how you lose the faith of the farms. What are some facets about the cacao trade that you feel people should know about, either specific to Vanuatu or cacao growing in general? You know, is there something you've learned, something very important that the public generally doesn't understand or appreciate in cacao growing? Uh, there, there is a lot of work going into that. Uh, when you buy a Pacific origin and people are shocked by the price, well, uh, we, we live at the far end of the world. Like I have one ship coming into the country every month. If I miss that ship, I'm two months late. Uh, moving stuff inter islands is a nightmare of logistic. We face uh, cyclones, we face earthquakes, we have active volcanoes. It's wild out here. So <laughs> when we um, come up with the chocolate bar in the $12 range, we're not stealing from you guys. Like we, We're basically implementing everything we can to keep it uh, affordable. But at some point, if you want something as exotic as a single origin Vanuatu chocolate bar, um, well, man, that's coming from the end of the world and it's something pretty rare. So you'd be ready to, to pay the price for that. Um, that that's one of the main things. Uh, the other is um, it's it's it, it's pretty hard to operate like year rounds with all the the challenges we face in terms of global warming. Uh, the impact of global warming are not faced by those who basically cause the harm. Uh, we're in the front line. Just this year, we had on a single week two category four out of five categories. It's the the, the strongest it could get mm. in March. Another category five, uh, TC Lola was in uh, October, which is out of the normal season. So we see a lot of things changing. We have to adapt and learn for that. We have no insurance company that's willing to work with us. So we are self-insured. We have to learn ways of, you know, making it happen no matter what. And our only way to self-insure is basically by developing stuff on East Coast and West Coast. It's very rare that a cyclone goes around, around a single island. So we'll take a bash on one side, but we'll save what we can on the other. And we create connection between farmers. So this year what happened is West Coast was uh, not affected at all. East Coast was severely affected. So we moved everyone from West Coast to East Coast to harvest whatever was available on the ground on the following days after the cyclone. Then we moved everyone back on the West Coast to finish the harvest season. And once harvest season finished, then we moved yeah. everyone back to the East Coast so we can pruning, cleaning, and replanting. That's the stuff and work that goes into your chocolate, which you never see and never hear about. Mm -hmm. And that's what's pumping and inflating the price because all of this has to be at some point paid for. People don't work for free, like right. as much as they love. And chocolate. Speaking on that line of sort of compensation for farmers, is there a variance in, in Vanuatu with, you know, working with you and the cacao that you're trying to use and export? Do farmers receive more money than if they were to work, you know, to grow cacao for the bulk sector? You know, is there incentive yep. there for them? Definitely. We, we actually measured the all the work that goes into the, the making of the cacao. And uh, we took standard, like, if you look at the weights done for the bulk markets, uh, they don't even pay minimum wage. They, they rather work on contracts saying, I buy you kilos. Right. But we heard that when we buy the kilo, the price of kilo actually reflects the amount of work that goes in based on the minimum wage. And I believe we're the only one doing it right now in Vanuatu. Our average purchasing price has always been uh, two to three times higher than the bulk markets. And uh, we've spitted the work, like we don't stop at the farmer's gate. One of the biggest, uh, I think, not misunderstanding, but things that needs to be learned is it's nice to pay a premium at farmer's gates, but if you don't look at what's happening behind that gate, lots of the abuses you find out are happening behind. You might have a landlord that's taking the, the highest chunk of the money and still right. pays the local time for the same job or more right. work. If you don't step into those last mile, last end part of the process, then your impact is not better than what it was before. You've just moved the problem one step further 
uh, outside of the, 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 the middleman. There is no more middleman now buying the cacao, reselling the cacao, but the landlord or the, the farm owner has become that person if you don't check it carefully. So the right. way we work is we have a register of every person working on every plantation. We impose that they're paid in cash, no more in kind, in kind kind of payments. And uh, the way to measure is we always go unannounced in any of those farms, regular basis, all year round. If I found out someone wasn't paid for more than three days, then I question. And because we pay a much higher pricing, they tend to play fair because we've had a few villages that try to go around and we stop working with them. And they're not surrounded by villages that actually pay the game and gets the nice income and buy new cars and get their actual level of living wow. increase. They're stuck where they are with, uh, they've tried to abuse the system. And so they're no longer part of that system. Mm. So that that's pretty much the only way to really get strong and, and commit to fair trade. Right, right. Huh. And do you find that there's farmers and people there who are asking to work with you because of what they see, because of the work and the outcome? Yeah, we, we, we are... We're limited because I never take new groups of farmers unless I have an actual contract to buy the cacao from them after they've been trained. Mm -hmm. So the development has been an organic growth. Uh, it's slower than I would love it to be. I'd love to convert every single farmer here into a fine flavor cacao market farmer because the, 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 the economical impact is tremendous. Uh, a village like Pinalum, it's been our first station. Uh, in five years' time, they've uh, they've got access to uh, solar water pumping. They now have water running through the whole village. Every single house has a shower, has a tap. Uh, that's wow. money that we, we we planted the seeds. We paid for the the solar water pump, and then they did the piping themselves. So it's it's always good to see that there is actual development. Uh, we see more cars, we see more people start inside businesses to, to assist or supply. Uh, basic retail needs are, are not covered. Uh, you don't have to travel to town to get new stuff. There, there's small shops popping up here and then. So that's, that's the actual stuff we can witness. And it's directly correlated to the how much cash you actually uh, send into the field. So okay. that's why we try and as much as we can right at those facilities so that we can pay the highest pricing for the staff that leaves the island. So it sounds like you're trying to create some momentum to keep this growing, but growing while you still have an understanding of what exactly is going on, right? You want to know exactly how the cacao is being fermented. You want to know that the practices are still ethical. Yes. Right. So what would, re what would it require to... I guess my question is, what is it that is required in order to continue to grow this fine cacao market in Vanuatu and get that cacao out into other chocolate makers as well? For us, it's basically, uh, well, finding final customers, like the end customers. Like we want to sell more cacao from Vanuatu origin to uh, chocolate makers. And that's what unlocks the job upstream. Like soon as we have firm orders confirmed, then we can start the job of training more farmers, building more dryers. Uh, I'm out in March to Malekula to build another six dryers, the 50 square meter size dryers. So you can process about uh, two tons a week per dryer. So that's increasing our capacity. Uh, so aside, our from, is... aside from cost, then what are some other challenges in finding new buyers and makers who want to use cacao from Vanuatu? The, the, the bean to bar world is a very fragmented market and buyers only buy like small amounts. There is a handful of large uh, bean to bars, which we all know the names and they can buy up to a container size. But the challenge is in finding five, 10 uh, makers that are keen to share a container load. A 20 foot container would hold up to 12 tons in good conditions with enough hair flows for the cacao to be uh, traveled in good conditions. Uh, it's hard to find people to commit for, for these large uh, volumes. So we, we, we have like our uh, growth has been organic and we've uh, gone up to 35 tons last year of dry stuff. Uh, it means we've processed about a hundred tons of wet beans 
which uh, in five years of full operation, seven years now, but COVID times slow us a bit. Uh, it's it's not bad. Like mm -hmm. we, we started the first mm -hmm. times. So we were on 35 this year. Uh, 2024, the target is to process and move 100 tons. So we have to build that infrastructure and train more people. Um, and now we see the, 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 the second generation of uh, farmers coming up because we've had people working for us for over 10 years now and they've become trainers. Like they, they completely took over the business, they're running it, they're training, they're, they're lining up new people. Like they, they are the ones detecting new locations, new potentials. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's great because it's outside of my, uh, I have no control over it anymore. Uh, we, we started something with uh, 10 guys I really trusted and knew uh, the families. I lived with them. And now it's just going um, like much faster. And it's nice to see. Wonderful. Like happily stepping out of the game. Like wherever I can delegate, I just do it. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so let's um, hone in more on your chocolate making now. Uh, you named your company after your, ga your grandfather, Gaston. Why did yeah. you uh, Why did you decide on that? Uh, ID came from my wife. Uh, I give her the credit for that. And uh, there are a few reasons. One, um, I, I was born, my grandfather passed already. So we never had that connection mm. you, you, you'd love as a kid with your grandparents. I missed that. So all I knew of him was stories from uh, passed on through uh, the family. But he was a successful entrepreneur, and because he was successful, I never had to be bothered for, for money. Like, my parents sent me to school. I was lucky to get an education, and it's a nice way to, to, to just, like, pay a, a respect to that. Sort of a tribute. And sorry, where was and this? It, where did you grow up? Uh, Southeast of France. My, my, my dad's Spanish. My mom is French. So I grew up in the French Riviera. Uh, mm. uh, my mom, was, uh, my, my grandfather uh, built a company on resorts. So I've been in hospitality my, my whole, uh, my birth to, to, <laughs> to, to the edge of traveling by myself. I was living in a resort. I never had a conventional house. My house was 70 rooms and 100 people oh. every day. <laughs> so exposure to the world, lots of people yeah. traveling, lots of different, that fed an appetite for traveling. Yeah. I can see that. And uh, having the, on the top of the door, it kind of stops me from taking shortcuts. Even if you if you wake up with the best intentions, uh, it's always easy to find a way of, you know, taking a shortcut, be, being a bit sneaky. I mean, that's human nature. So with the name on the front door, I don't want to tarnish mm. that name. I mm. want to make it the best I can. And, that's a good point. And, and, Safe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When it comes to chocolate making, were you happy when you were making your first batches? Was it a success story right away? Or was there a lot of learning involved as far as roasting and refining? But my first was the best in the world. It was <laughs> the first chocolate I made by my so It was very <laughs> pleasing, but it was a full two ingredients, very rustic finish type of chocolates. Mm. Uh, it took years. I, I still learned like I had a batch running uh, on uh, Friday and uh, I was supposed to stop the conching. I got stuck outside of the factory with all the jobs it ran for another day and what came out was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I'm still learning. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a non-stop uh, learning. But uh, yeah, no, practice makes perfect. So it took years before we really understood what we were doing. Right. Uh, we now have a pretty nice... But, well, it's very related to the type of equipment you're using. Uh, we've upgraded with some of the, the packing line. You can see, like, behind me, like, Goodwin Hour, uh, Pre-Refiner, like, two-roll Pre-Refiner. Mm. This sort of things get you uh, a better refining, a better... Uh, more control. More homogeneous uh, yeah. part control, like, size of parts into your chocolates. So it gets smoother, it gets creamier, it's it's all that. Um, the, the roasting is infinite, pretty much like coffee. Mm. Uh, I've learned a lot from, you know, attending trade shows as well and, and all the other chocolate makers of met. I, I find it to be a very open uh, market. I don't feel like we compete. Uh, I've got lots of friends with chocolate makers. 
uh, a guy who really inspired some of our most successful bars. Um, it's Coco Caravan from the UK. I met Jake in, um, it was in San Francisco. Uh, we went for the trade, the uh, Dandelion organized the trade festival back in 2020. Mm. And he had, uh, he only does raw chocolates. Uh, at the time, the, the, the fancy stuff was going for high percentage bars, 85, 90, 100, mm. which I sometimes find hard. Like they do taste horrible. I believe not every cacao is meant to be not turned every cacao, into a no. high yeah. dish. And uh, talking to Jake, he was like, you know, for raw chocolate, I can't use every origins. Like only a handful of origins really work. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's quite challenging. And I tried this bar from um, the, it was the Jamaican 72% uh, bar that he traveled with. It was a beautiful uh, creation. And the flavors were very similar to our cacao. And I was like, I'm sure I could come up with something similar. Okay. I got back, exchanged with him, and the 72% bar we came up with with our first silver medal at the Academy of Chocolate Awards. So I was pretty stoked. Like, that's all about meeting someone, uh, going beyond the, the trend, because the trend was for high percentage. I was like, I don't mm. want to go that way. I'd like something else. And we came up with that raw chocolate that tasted so different. You have to create for your market, right? So who is your market in yeah. Vanuatu? Uh, we mostly we mostly have people visiting from Australia and New Zealand. They're the the neighbor countries with large populations. We have cruise ships. Uh, this year only, it's about two hundred cruise ships in the year. So that's uh, that that that's where the the the, the people are coming from. Mm. Uh, but we try and make chocolate for everyone. Not everyone is a fine connoisseur. Like maybe a, a a person a customer in ten really knows about chocolates. Right. And I don't think. Being a chocolate maker has to be only for uh, chocolate snobs, if I put no. it that way. And I'm one. I love my chocolate, but right. I think I, I really enjoy processing 30% Cadbury type milk chocolate. Right. Only we do it with the ingredients. And, you know, <laughs> it's a product that's coming out that's a bit different. And people are like, oh, that's actually nice. The, the biggest right. sell here is milk. Right. Yeah. I mean, if your I market is... Of, uh, Australians and New Zealanders, they tend to like it a little bit sweeter, I find. That's what tends to sell over yep. there. So that makes sense. And what about the locals in Vanuatu, the people who maybe never had this bean to bar chocolate? You know, what did they think of it when you started giving it to them? Uh, they were like, that's not chocolate. <laughs> Let's be straight, like the, the, the thing they used to eat is uh, very high in sugar type of, I, I call them candy bars, they're right. not really chocolate. Yeah. You read the ingredients or all the stuff and cacao in there and that's what they got used to. But now they've learned, like uh, mm. Roy, my production manager, he was a farmer, very committed farmer and now he's a very talented roster. He runs most oh, of really? the production. Wow. He's, yeah, he's done all the machines. Uh, I've got his wife in the shop and she's the assistant production manager. And uh, no, it's it, these are nice stories. Like, So have you seen had, uh, their palate change? Like some of these people you said, they're like, this is probably too bitter, too intense. Do they like it now? Are they enjoying it? Yes. Yeah, 100%. that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we've tried to come up with a lot of inclusion in our bars that reflect the local terroir as well. Uh, yeah, mention we were... some of those. Uh, you have nanange and kumbava. Yeah. What are those ingredients? Yeah. So they're all like, when we can find a twist to, like European markets led the development of chocolate for, for, for centuries. Right. And uh, when you love your uh, roasted hazelnut caramel type of chocolates, well, we have nangai nut here. And when you roast them, they taste like hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, why not give it a twist and make it a hundred percent Vanuatu terroir? So we work with local nuts. We have the Natapua, the Nangai. Uh, they're endemic to the region. They grow. You find them in PNG, Solomon's. Um, we use the lolly cherries. Uh, even the raspberry. It's the local raspberry. It's not the one you know. It's very citrusy in flavor. Okay. Uh, very grainy in uh, in consistency. So. 
there's all the kind of small challenge we come up with and we have a range of uh, chocolate truffles and bonbons that allows us to play a lot more with the local terroir which mm. we don't export life is short and mm -hmm. uh, we intend to keep it that way that's a that's a, a trigger for people to travel down to want to try our bonbons <laughs> no i think that's incredible that you have you know, obviously the chocolate bar was invented in Europe. So obviously their preferences for flavors is going to be incorporated. But now like you, you have chocolate makers all over the world and you're using local flavors and changing our perception of what goes with chocolate. I think that's very fascinating. If you see the job these guys at Mission Chocolate are doing in Brazil, I, I love to follow all these guys who are in different countries because right. that's giving twist. It's inspired by the... The, the, the local culture, uh, I love uh, Vincent and, and, and Sam at Maru, they, they inspired most of mm. our work as well, and they've, they've managed to capture, it, it's a blend of the best of both cultures, basically, like, you step in with the European knowledge of chocolate making, and then you let it completely uh, being influenced and embrace the, the local culture, and it has to transpire in your chocolate, and that's the beauty of yeah. being a about three to bar in, in a cocoa producing country. I'd be silly not to tap into these flavors. Like they're everywhere in the field and they grow on the side of the farms as well. So I can buy more stuff from these farmers. Exactly. A cacao farm. Yeah. Never forget, like they're also coconut farmers, cava farmers, nuts farmers. Like we, we tend to categorize them and that's a, a, a big challenge. I, I always have that chat with most of the developing agencies and like, you're surprised the cacao farmers are not attending your workshop today, but you're also running a cava workshop on the side, and they're also cava farmers, the same people. So you cannot categorize them as cacao farmers. They do cacao when it's cacao season, when the right. season is off, they have a crop. That's a so really good point. Yeah. It's something that's influencing their lives, and you have to, to acknowledge, except we, I run a, a series of bonbons with uh, eggplants. And eggplant here is sort of a bad herb. They don't even eat the fruit of eggplant. They're wild eggplants. And we started putting that in chocolate. And they were like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Like, <laughs> you know, this good thing. And now I go to Malekula and sometimes they serve me eggplant with an egg. And they're so proud. They're like, hey, we, 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 we eat that vegetable now. We didn't do that wow. before. And that's fun. It's good interactions. And, yeah. and I love it. Yeah, it's amazing Spike. to see where where the chocolate world is going to be headed now, you know, because we have, it, you know, like you said, we're taking chocolate that was invented in Europe and we're bringing it to all these different places, sort of like bread making, right? Everyone in every corner of the world makes bread, but they do it in their own way. They have their own ingredients that they incorporate. And we haven't seen that with chocolate in our lifetime, but we're starting to see it now. So it's very, very exciting to see what's going to happen. It is. And the possibilities are almost endless. You can always come up with some challenging stuff. Uh, this one thing I really love in this world of chocolate is whenever I have a chance to travel and attend uh, another like Salon du Chocolat elsewhere, I'm, I'm always keen and eager to try everything. Like I, I'm just a, a sucker for chocolate, like <laughs> almost a nerd. Like I go and shake hands with everyone, like, hey, I'm only, and this is what I'm doing. And, and, and that's how, like, you got to be humble. But when you approach people, You'd be surprised the amount of knowledge they're keen to share and how helpful they are. Some of them have become really good friends and we exchange on a like, monthly basis uh, about machines, equipment, techniques, stuff, and I love it, really. Wonderful. And what about your family? Do you have family still back in France? What do they think about all the work you've done? Do they enjoy your chocolate? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, well, my family is firstly my kids and wife. They all live here with me in Vanuatu now. But I have my parents in France. Uh, my brother lives in uh, Ireland. Uh, it's challenging to 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 get to see each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen them for three and a half years with the COVID time. Right. I couldn't travel. Risk myself to travel to get stuck somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, these have been challenging times, but. Uh, I think they rather love me living my passion than, you know, uh, living next to them and mm. not living my dreams. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Like, they've always been very supportive. Yeah. Uh, they're traveling. They're coming in uh, Vanuatu next week, actually. It's, oh, wow. it's quite nice. That's okay, we just had a baby who was born uh, about a uh, month ago. So oh, awesome. So, uh, end of Jan. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah. where do you have your storefront? Where do people find you in Vanuatu? Where do you sell your chocolate? The, the, the chocolate factory is right in town center of Port Vila. That's the capital city of uh, Vanuatu on Efate Island. 
uh, it's one of the two port of entries like airports or uh, cruise ships. Uh, so we're easy to find. As soon as you hit Vanuatu, Efate, you're downtown in Port Vila uh, on the main street. So that's pretty good. Uh, we have a coffee shop. Uh, I can show you. Is it like it's the, the factory? Oh, yeah. And, uh, Beautiful. See, like there is a coffee shop down there. The girls are running. We we use uh, local coffee as well. They're not mm -hmm. just growing coffee on an island. So we try and put forward as much as we can of the local terroir. Wonderful. Which is uh, reflecting in all the, the, the baking, the pastries, all the stuff that we sell at the coffee shop. And do you offer events, tastings, tours, anything like that for people who are visiting? We do tours any time of the day. Uh, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to go through the process, see what we do. So we don't charge anything for that. And we only ask people if they actually enjoy the product to buy chocolate bars. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fair trade. Uh, all the staff are trained and know the whole story of Gaston. The part of it, uh, the main instruction I gave them is anyone wants to talk to you, you stop your job and you chat with people. Mm. Like we want to share the, the, the whole shop is behind glasses. Uh, we operate uh, 24 seven people can see what's happening behind those uh, glasses, nothing to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, the floors are white. So, you know, that we operate clean. We are HACCP certified, uh, B Corp certified as well. So we try okay. and put all that for them and, and share with the clients. Mm -hmm. And do you have any goals that you want to share? Goals maybe for your company, uh, goals maybe for the cacao industry in Vanuatu? Yeah, definitely. Um, we'd like to be identified as the, the the best cacao you can find from, from Vanuatu and possibly from Melanesia. Uh, we'd like to make a name for, for Vanuatu cacao because it's beautiful. And I think it's very exotic, like, Having a chocolate bar that says Vanuatu on your shelves would just attract people who buy mm. just for the name. Mm. It's it's so, tick, so remote, so unknown. Uh, these shores and islands, they're, they're, they're pretty unique. They're as raw as it gets. Uh, I can jump on my bike and ride to the next volcano and sit on the edge of the volcano and see it blast above my head. And no one's going to tap on my shoulder and say, hey, dude, this is dangerous. Don't do it. <laughs> That's the level of freedom that still exists in here. Wow. Uh, we try and share a lot of it on our Instagram page. Uh, anytime I'm off to the island, I try and, and take pictures and post a lot. Uh, we harvest on horses. We, we, we just do it the local way. Uh, yeah, we, we'd love to export more cacao from here so people can enjoy. It. And I, I enjoy seeing chocolate makers working our cacao beans as well. I'm always amazed by the type of creation they came up with. We have uh, a dozen of really core customers in New Zealand now. Uh, it's beautiful to see to see what they're doing. Foundry chocolates, uh, Coronado chocolates, Wellington chocolate factory. Mm. They all have a way at interpreting our cacao. And uh, they always send us bars for the staff to try and stuff. And I'm amazed oh, by the, the skills those guys have and what they came up with. It's it's beautiful to know you've grown the stuff that they're using to make different creations and, and, and it's all made with the same plantation, same cacao. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very fascinating that, you know, like like you said, these different makers using the exact same batch of cacao that you use and coming up with something completely different. It's It really is an art in itself. What would you say, just to finish off here, what are some key aspects in the world of craft bean to bar chocolate, which you think need to improve, right? Every industry has areas to improve. What do you think can improve in the craft chocolate world, bean to bar chocolate world, in order to keep it going, to keep it growing? What would you say? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. And I 100% I, I agree with you. We, we, we have to learn, we have to improve. Um, we've done a big job on trying to understand and measure our actual uh, environmental and social impacts. Uh, I think there is a lot of communication that goes around fair trade, doing better for the farmers, but it's sometimes hard for me to picture what it really means. Mm. And uh, mm. I'm sure we can improve in the ways we measure. You know, sometimes you mm. don't capture the harm because you don't even have the actual uh, data. Right. Like capturing data, getting the knowledge. Like I've, I've done most of my reading lately was all about cadmium contents and the transfer of cadmium from the soil, the type of soil that would favor cadmium uh, transfer into cacao, 
Uh, it could be mitigated through fermentation. So we're running lots of tests on how to uh, drop the cadmium levels. Ours are far below the, the actual uh, international norms. Mm -hmm. But if we be able to supply uh, a super low guaranteed uh, cadmium right. uh, type of material that we want. And the other is uh, I'm dreaming of coming up with an actual carbon neutral cacao. And I'd be curious to see how the world market responds to that. Like we, we're trying to measure every single steps of the, the, the supply chain, mm -hmm. see what we can do in terms of mitigation and uh, compensation. And I'd like to commercialize the first uh, carbon-free cacao and see if makers are keen to pay because the price will be much higher than what we actually pay. Right. We, we, we don't pay the price of things. And at some point, it's got to be reflected because you can use words such as sustainable, mm -hmm. if you make the actual measurement to make sure and ensure it is actually sustainable. Mm. And I believe the, the chocolate is still one of the worst products in terms of uh, carbon impact. Like it travels the world. Mm. It's growing in foreign countries. It's traveling on big vessels. It's being transformed in places and sold in others. Think about cacao from Vanuatu traveling to Europe, being turned into chocolate bars traveling back to Asia. Like right. it's got around the world for $5, $6 on the shelf. Mm. Mm. It really for the arm glucose, I don't think so. Mm. So well, I believe there is a lot to learn on those angles. Well, thank you. I really appreciate uh, learning about everything that you're doing there. It sounds like there's a lot of incredible things happening in Vanuatu in regards to cacao. It sounds like you're doing an incredible job. So I hope that it continues. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joseph. I appreciate the opportunity as well. And uh, yeah, anyone wants to visit Vanuatu, you're welcome. <laughs> you're Crazy to find. Thank you, Olivier. All the best. Thank you for as well. I, I am really reading all your job on cadmium and stuff. Like that's very <laughs> Thank helpful. You. You're very welcome. I appreciate it. Okay. You take care. Yeah, take care. Bye. Take care. Download the free Bean to Bar app to connect with incredible chocolate makers from around the world. Also, be sure to visit beantobarworld.com, your portal for all things fine chocolate, virtual tastings, free learning resources, research, and much more. Subscribe to the newsletter to stay in touch and donate to the free app and free resources here. Contact me for any chocolate-related questions you may have.